number two for chapter 15. We'll be looking at electric fields, as you can tell by the title. And we begin with a, probably one of the most famous experimental physicists and chemists of the 19th century, Michael Faraday. Probably one of my all-time favorite people in the history of science. Uh, along with Michael Faraday, who did all the hands-on work as far as electric motors, electric um, generators, and uh, he also did a lot in electrochemistry. And you're going to see his work here. Uh, along with him was James Clerk Maxwell, who did the mathematic, ma uh, mathematical and the theoretical work in terms of electromagnetic propagation of energy with, that we call light. And both Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell were extraordinary Christian men who practiced their faith faithfully and lived a very lived very godly lives. Uh, Michael Faraday was part of a very, very small um, group of Christians called the Sandemanians, and their perception was to live as simply as possible, as carefully as possible, to um, not accept glory and fame and wealth, even if it came their way, to spend a lot of time um, focusing on service and on prayer and on faithfully exercising the di disciplines of biblical Christianity. Michael Faraday was offered a knighthood, which he refused. He was offered many prestigious positions, which he refused, many of which came with a lot of money. He was even offered a very nice place to live uh, that would go along with one of the positions that he did take as a, as a leader in the field. Um, and he refused that and lived in, in somewhat poverty, he and his wife. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't believe they were, had children, um, but they lived very simply. And he had an interesting background as a boy. Uh, he had a speech impediment, and that speech impediment, again, if I remember correctly, made it difficult for him to pronounce the letter R. So he would say, Michael Faraday, when the teacher called on him, and the kids would laugh. And so he basically got removed from school, and he had to go find a job, and he took a job working for a bookbinder, um, ended up reading lots of the books that the bookbinder was making, um, took an interest in the books in science, so and gave him an opportunity to hear Sir Humphrey Davy do kind of like a, a science show, and he became enamored by that, became an apprentice for Sir Humphrey Davy, and then later on went, became probably the most famous experimental uh, scientist of the 19th century. A very humble man, good example to follow. In any case, we've talked an awful lot about gravitational forces and the gravitational fields that surround objects that have mass. We're going to be talking about electrical fields now. And these field forces are remarkable in that they are forces that act at a distance, which was the phrase used way back when Isaac Newton and those following him began to investigate fields. Instead of forces have to, having to be the result of anything that is in contact, these forces could act through space without there being physical contact to make things happen, such as gravity and such as an electrical charge. <clears throat> there does not have to be any contact. So the whole concept of fields, uh, which is somewhat imaginary, um, but very, very practical as a model, um, sort of abandoned, helped us to abandon magic, and yet at the same time continued to embrace um, mental pictures of things that were not physical. Um, now, keep in mind that there's a big difference between the gravitational force and then electrostatic force, and that is that the gravitational force is always attractive, we're still working on trying to find an anti-gravitational force, but the electrostatic force can be a force that both attracts or repulses. And a couple important points here. Again, it acts at a distance. Um, 
And we call that acting at a distance without being in physical contact, a field. And now we need to have ways to take this mental model and represent it somehow on paper or on projection. And you're going to see us drawing field lines. You'll be drawing field lines in a little bit. <clears throat> now, in figure 15.9, right over here, we imagine a charged object. We'll keep it simple. We'll call it a sphere. And this charged object, we don't really care how it's become positively charged. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, in order to study this large object, large by comparison, that is a positive charge, we introduce a test charge right here. Q sub ought, the little O. <coughs> And that test charge, theoretically, again, is so small so as not to distort anything about the electrical field that surrounds the source charge. And by looking at what the test charge does when it's in the vicinity of the source charge, we are able to um, learn something about the electrical field around the source charge. Now, typically, by definition, our test charge is a positive charge. And again, the idea is that it does not distort, distort our, the electrical field around the source charge at all. Now, of course, technically, it does have to make a little bit of difference, but it would be something that is very, very insignificant. And you can see a little bit of quantum theory behind here, because the very act of measuring or testing something in this case, the source charge, to learn something about it, actually affects the very thing you're trying to study. If you shine light on something and so that you can investigate it, how do you know that when the light reflects off of it and comes to your eyes, that you have not somehow distorted it by the very light itself so that the image you're getting back is not exactly what the image was, the, I mean, the object was when the light struck it in the first place. And this is one of the key platforms behind quantum theory and quantum mechanics and leads to something that we call uncertainty that is intrinsic in every measurement. But that's for a later chapter. <clears throat> so we can learn an awful lot about the strength of this electrical field around the source charge. If we move this positive charge, let's say, way out to here, or we move it really, really close, we can learn by what happens to that positive charge, whether it is repelled a little bit or repelled a lot about the strength of the electrical field. Now, by definition, that's what this means here, the triple lines. By definition, the electrical field is defined as the force of that electrical field per that very, very minuscule point charge. And you're going to see this configuration a lot, that the force equals the electrical field times Q. And by the way, these are vectors, which is why you've got those arrows over the top. Now, one other thing about electrical fields. We always talk about electric fields as acting from the positive to the negative. And later on, when we draw arrows to represent electrical fields, by convention all over the world, <clears throat> ever since uh, Michael Faraday came up with this 150 years ago or whatever, we have used that same convention. We draw our electric field line arrows going from positive charge to the negative charge. So taking a look at this picture right here in part A, here we have a negatively charged object, and we have our um, a is going to represent um, something that is in the field around the, um, the charged object. and Or we could just say, what about at point A? It doesn't even have to be an object. What at, point, what at point A, what would the electric field look like? Well, because this object is negative, the electric field goes towards the negative coming from someplace out here that, with, by comparison, is positive. Now, next, if we have a positively charged object and we put 
some, and we wonder what is my electrical field at point P, um, at point P we would have to draw our electrical field line going away, being repelled, like charges. Um, the electrical field, excuse me, goes from the positive out to the negative. And then finally, um, in part C, we actually have a, a physical test charge that is positive, and we put it in the vicinity of the charged object, which is, uh, by definition, much, much larger, significantly larger, So, and the point charge is negligible. And we say, well, what's going to happen to this? Well, not only do you see a bit of a distortion um, in terms of repelling the positive charge, or at least drawing negative electrons towards the positive point charge, but you also can imagine that it's going to move in this direction away as it's being repelled. Now we can take the equ equation earlier and make it more generic and come up with this equation right here, that the magnitude and direction of the force that will be exerted on some charge Q will be dependent upon the strength of the electrical field and the direction that it is going. So it's going to, the force is going to be exerted in the direction of the field. We say that an electric field exists at a point if a test charge at that point is subject to an electric force. So in other words, if I were to take a charge or a point charge and move it a thousand miles away, from a charged balloon or something like that, well, for all intents and purposes, the electric field is zero because it's so far away as to be irrelevant, insignificant, unmeasurable. Um, and so the, we say the electric field is, exists, or at least is relevant, I'm at a point of the test charge at that point is subject to an electric force. Now, you might remember this law right here, Coulomb's law, we had that in the previous screencast. And if I multiply both sides by R, here's an R there, and I'm going to get rid of one of the R's there, so I just have a single R in the denominator. Um, we, we can derive an equation where we have force times distance is going to be the amount of work done um, moving, a, uh, moving charged particles around. But what we're more interested in here, I'm going to erase that, is let's um, divide both sides by the point charge. So if I put that in the denominator there and the point charge in the denominator on the left side, you can see it cancels out here. And you should remember from up here that F divided by Q equals E. And so we, that gives us this equation right here, that my electrical field equals my um, Coulomb's constant, uh, my proportionality constant, times the absolute value of my charged object, Q, divided by um, the distance from the, the source squared, depending on how far away you are from uh, where your electric field begins. So we can sum that up here. An electric field at a given point depends only on the charge Q on the object and on the distance R from the object to a specific point in space. So if I have an object that has some charge Q, I can determine the strength of the electric field there and there and over there and way out there and way up there and way over there, if you notice where I pointed, all over the place. All I need to know is the magnitude of Q and this distance from the center, R, or this distance here, R. So we can say that, as a result, an electric field exists at any point, whether or not there is a test charge at P. So even though we can't see the electrical field, even though we don't have um, a way to at the moment to directly measure it, like with a test charge, we know that there has to be an electrical field there by deduction. 
Now, a principle of superposition, which you've seen before in the previous screencast, um, not to be confused with the principle of superposition when you're adding um, transverse waves together, for example, um, is when we add the electric fields together as vectors. And we're going to look at that over here. So, in this particular um, experiment that is described, it actually refers to something called the Millikan oil drop experiment. And that is going to be covered in more detail later in the chapter. The main purpose of the Millikan oil drop experiment was to get an oil drop as it moved through the air to acquire a static charge, and then to trap that statically charged oil drop in an electrical field so that you have gravity pulling it down one way and the electrical field pulling it up the other direction. And then when you get that oil drop to basically hover, to not move down by gravity or not move up by the electrical field, but just to stay in position, then we know we've reached equilibrium. Then we know that the downward force due to gravity is equal to the upward force, EQ, of the electric field. And that's what we state right here, that the summation of the forces, in this case in the vertical direction, if, if you look at my drawing, let me move this to the other side. You can see that the downward force due to gravity and the upward force due to the charged particle being, and this is Q here, being an electrical field are equal and opposite. And so now it's not going to accelerate in either direction. Doesn't mean it can't move with a constant velocity, but it's not going to accelerate. And in fact, with the right type of setup, and that's what the Millikan oil drop experiment does so well, as you'll see um, in the last screencast, um, is you can actually look through a little micro telescope at the oil drop and watch it move up or down as you adjust the voltage. Obviously, you cannot adjust gravity, but you can adjust the voltage and watch it go up and down. And as a result, you can begin to figure out exactly what is the magnitude of charge on that oil drop. In this case, negative 4.85 times 10 to the minus 19th. And again, the negative sign never means less than zero. The negative sign here is going to indicate the, the direction. Now, once we have that bit of information in place, we can find the charge on the falling droplet. And so first thing we're going to do is find the acceleration acting on it. And once we know the acceleration acting on it, then we can plug it into this equation right here. Here is my um, force, which is mass times acceleration. And the acceleration is the combined acceleration of being in the electric field plus gravity. They could be working together. They could be working opposite each other. In this case, they're working opposite each other. And we can solve this for Q. And now I know the magnitude of charge on the oil drop. Now, the amazing thing that Millikan did was he did this experiment like a thousand times for a thousand different oil drops and got a thousand different charges of those oil drops. And then he said, well, what's the biggest number that can go into all of those charges? because the biggest number would be the size of a single charge. Because if you think about it, the difference between the charge on all these oil drops depends upon how many electrons it has. And so you would expect all the different oil drops, small, big, medium size, whatever, they all have different charges. Uh, you would expect that the difference in charge would be some multiple number of your fundamental negative charge, which we know to be the electron. And that's pretty significant in order to be able to determine the charge of arguably the smallest known particle in the universe, naturally occurring particle. All right, using the principle of superposition. This is like section 15.3 in the previous screencast. So, we have a charge of seven microcoulombs. Make sure you don't forget micro symbol at an origin. Okay, so that's Q1 right there. 
And then uh, we have Q2 located right there at some distance towards the right, 0 0.300 meters. We want to find the magnitude and direction of the electric field at point P, and here's point P, which has coordinates of 0 0.400 meters. So here's my 0 0.400 meters, my 0 0.300 meters, and if you remember a 3-4-5 triangle, conveniently the hypotenuse then is 0 0.500 0 meters. Now, the reason we're using the principle of superposition is because my this point here in space is under, is under the influence of the electrical field from Q1 and the electrical field from Q2 at the same time. And though these two electrical fields are not physical, they're invisible, um, and so they blend with each other, if you will, just like two water waves going through each other on, um, on a smooth lake from two different motorboats going by or something. So we're going to find that due to Q1, my um, electric field is going to be going in this direction, going from the positive to the negative. Remember, this is positive. And due to this electric field, my electric field is going to want to go in this direction, going towards the negative, because this one is negative. So we are going to add these two triangles together. Create my parallelogram. There is my resultant. That is the arrow we're trying to find. Now you can use the law of sines and the law of cosines if you want, but our textbook has taken the strategy of um, componentizing any vector that's not acting along the x or y axis. We'll get to that in just a minute. So the first thing we need to do is to find out what is the strength of the electric field due to Q1. And so we just plug our numbers in. We're using our constant, about 9 times 10 to the 9th, or about 9 billion um, newtons meters squared per coulomb squared. And notice that we have to convert the micro into 10 to the minus 6 in order for our dimensions to work out. Make sure this is in meters. Your problem gave it to you in meters, but somebody giving you a test, hint, hint, might not give it to you in meters. And we can find the strength of the electrical field um, at point P due to Q1. Then we can do the same thing here. We can find the strength of the electrical field um, at 4.1 and plug our numbers in again. Just double checking to make sure I'm, yeah, this is the one for right here. And then this is the one for right up here. Okay. Next thing we do is we componentize to find our X component and our Y component. Which component are we talking about? Well, as you can imagine, we are talking about finding this and this. You can see that the blue one here and the red one here are going to partially offset each other. And as far as this X component is concerned, conserved, uh, concerned, it's the only one. So we componentize the vector that is not acting along the axes so that we can find the X and the Y component. And when we do that, we set up a triangle like this. Notice we still have a net vector acting upwards. This arrow, remember, used to be bigger, but there was also a corresponding part going down. So when we subtracted, we got this as our net Y vector. We only had one vector acting in the X direction. So now we can use the Pythagorean theorem right here to solve for the um, vector right here, the diagonal. 
and then I can solve for the sine of my angle, which turns out to be 66.6 .6 degrees. All right, talking about electrical field lines. Now we leave the mathematics a little bit and get into more of the uh, picturalization uh, or modeling of an electrical field. And very simply, we're going to use electric field lines that we're going to draw. And when we draw these electric field lines, uh, sometimes they, the electric fields are just go straight outward, and sometimes they can be contorted and curved based upon other electrical fields that might be in the area. But the main point I want to point out is this one. Um, when we draw this, since we're representing the electrical field, if we want to compare a strong electrical field to a weak electrical field, we would represent the stronger electrical field with more lines and the weaker electric field with less lines. So let's look at what that means. And the number of lines you draw is, is basically arbitrary, though you'll see some guidelines in a little bit. So if I have a positive charge in the very center right here, my electric field goes from the positive outward. So these are all vectors heading outward. Um, and what you should notice, if I were to draw a box right here, two of these field lines there and there are in that box. Now, if I draw a similar box, let's say way out there, same size, I only have that line in the box. Obviously, the density of lines in this box is greater than the density of lines in that box, which means in this box, there is a stronger electrical field being represented, represented than in this box out here. If I had a negative point charge, then the arrows are going in, but the same thing is going to be true. Now, that's pretty straightforward. And you can see that the people that wrote the book decided that they were going to make 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 lines to represent whatever the magnitude of this electrical field happens to be. Now, let's take a look at, if I can get my screen to settle down. There we go. Let's take a look at figure 15.14 right here. Here I have two point charges, one positive, one negative. They are in close proximity so that they affect each other. Notice that all my lines are going from the positive to the negative. Notice that if we count up the lines going around the positive charge, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so forth, and then count up the number of lines going around the negative charge, or back to it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth, you'll find they are the same number of lines leaving the positive charge as are um, going towards the negative charge, which would therefore imply that the positive charge, I'll call that Q plus, and the, and the negative charge, Q minus, must each equal each other in magnitude. Notice that some of these lines, in a sense, go all the way out to infinity. To infinity and beyond. A couple of points. Number one, the lines for a group of point charges must begin on positive. In some cases, they can end up or come from an infinite distance. Number two, the stronger we want to say an electrical field is, we're going to represent it with more lines. And something that may not have been obvious but should be intuitive, and that is that no two field lines can cross each other. You're not going to have one field line sort of going like this, crossing it, okay? Impossible. Now, an electrical dipole, you might remember this from chemistry, when we talk about the water molecule that looks like this with its two lone pair of electrons around the oxygen, oxygen atom. Here's my negative pole. And where the proton, the H plus is, I have my positive side. 
I have a dipole. Negative and positive overall. We could measure the strength of this dipole, uh, which is what we do in chemistry. We measure the strength of dipoles in a unit called a Debye. For those of you that might want to remember your chemistry, but that's not, we're, we're not going to worry about that in AP Physics. But um, different, um, we can create different kinds of electric dipoles, both in engineering, but also in terms of molecules. Uh, the water molecule, which is a dipole, means it has a certain strength of the dipole, strong enough to pull apart some ionic compounds, but not strong enough to pull apart other ionic compounds. So when we come over to look at this picture right here, now we have a positive charge, and let's count up the lines. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So we have 16 lines representing the electrical field around the positive charge. And when we look at the negative charge, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We have 8 lines representing the electrical field around the negative charge. So obviously we have half as many lines because we want to connote the idea or demonstrate the uh, idea that the negative charge has half the magnitude of charge as does the positive charge. So if we call the negative charge Q, then the positive charge is going to be 2Q. We're going to skip that section. It's just a basic way of, um, but we should mention some interesting numbers. The electrical field near the, near the surface of the Earth on a nice day is about 100 newtons per coulomb acting towards the Earth. The Earth is actually a negatively charged object in the sense of being the electrical sink. Every time a lightning bolt goes from the cloud <coughs> down to the Earth, not all electric bolts go that direction, but that's because electricity ends up going back into the Earth. Um, electrical devices are grounded, so the electrical charge, the negative charge, goes back to the Earth. So when we talk about the Earth, the arrows would all point towards the Earth as a very, very large negatively charged particle, if you will. However, if we got a thundercloud going on, we suddenly go from 100 up to 20,000 newtons per coulomb. And this is a device that can actually measure the current, which we use ammeters for that, which we'll get to in a later chapter. Now, the last part for this particular screencast is about conductors in electrostatic equilibrium. And when you're in e electrostatic equilibrium, it means the charged particles in the surface of something aren't going anywhere because they are tugged on in all the different directions equally, so there is no net electrical field for, to cause it to move one way or the other. A couple of observations. The electric field is zero everywhere inside. Now think about it, if you have um, charged particles inside something, um, whether they're charged particles of, of dust and pollen or whatever, or maybe it's a solid charge, solid chunk of copper or something, charged particles are going to repel each other because they have the same charge. And when they repel each other, they're going to get as far away from each other as they can get, which causes them all to end up on the surface. So you would be perfectly safe inside a charged object if it were hollow. Um, and that's number two. The excess charge will always be on its surface, zero on the inside. Number three, the electric field just outside a charged conductor is perpendicular to the conductor surface, which means, of course, going outward. Inside, your charge is zero but your negative charge is going to be around the outside. And then number four, on an irregularly shaped conductor, the charge, interestingly, accumulates at the sharp points. And that's going to require some explanation in just a minute. So the first property can be understood by examining what would happen if the electric field um, was not zero everywhere inside the conducting material. If that were not true, 
then you would have charged particles moving around, which we call current. And therefore, that would mean you're not at equilibrium. Number two, um, it's an inverse square law as far as the repulsion is concerned. And that can actually be derived through the methods of calculus. Number three, the point about uh, going perpendicular. Um, with any power law, an excess of charge would exist on its surface. And um, as we've seen with other feet, um, I'm sorry, way down here, I skipped a paragraph. Well, if that were not true, if that were not true, um, you'd have a component al along the surface. You might have, coming back to this diagram, if you, you would end up having currents moving along the surface of your conductor, con conducting material, not just necessarily inside like we talked about when we looked at point number one. And so therefore it would not have been at equilibrium. And we've defined this as being equilibrium. But number four um, is counterintuitive initially. You would think the charged particles would want to come over here and they would not be quite as many there because of the fact that you've got more space on the left than you have on the right. And that turns out not to be true because when you have an excess of electrical charges, those electrical charges are repelling each other in all different directions. And over here, these electrical charges, because this is a very, very shallow curved surface, they can really move far apart from each other because they've got lots of room to move apart. And so your density of electrical charge on the left side of this object is rather low. On the right side, your negatively charged particles can't go far, very far apart. They just can't get far away from each other because there is no other place to go unless you could somehow um, arc um, through the air. And we'll talk about uh, that kind of idea later in the book. So they can't go very far, and so your greatest charge density is actually at the pointed object. And this is an experiment tries to illustrate that point. Um, where we, This is what you have done or will do in lab six when you take a negatively charged object and you take it down inside a, what is called a Faraday cage. Think of a styrofoam cup and you're looking down inside the styrofoam cup. But instead of being made out of styrofoam, let's say it's made out of metal or wire basket. And as you move the negatively charged object carefully without touching the sides down into the interior of this cage, you'll notice it repels all the electrons. They try to get as far away from the charged particle as possible. Then when you actually touch the bottom, um, well, actually before you touch the bottom, way up here, you'll notice my meter shows you with um, zero uh, current. I'm just checking to make sure they're doing this in current or charge. Um, or at least even just a potential difference between the charged object and the surface. In this picture now, you've got um, a dipole set up. Negative here, positive along the interior. Then when you actually make contact down here in object number three, you drop off all of your negative electrons because the negative electrons all want to get as far away from each other as they can. And so once again, you have an overall net negative charge. And then you remove your object that was charged up and you leave behind a permanently, and by permanent I don't mean forever, but depending on environmental conditions, it could be a few seconds, a few minutes, or longer, a charged object. We're going to see how this plays into something called the Van de Graaff generator in the last screencast. By the way, one practical application of this is a lightning rod. Lightning rod was first developed by a guy named Benjamin Franklin. Very, very famous polymath early on in the history of the United States. Uh, very important person in signing of the, of the Constitution. Um, 
was very respectful of the Christian religion, certainly believed in a God, but, but he himself was not a Christian. We might think of him as being more of a deist. He was also a um, diplomat. But it's kind of interesting to note that this remarkable discovery that had all kinds of applications in industry and protecting major structures, um, it was hard for Europe to embrace the idea that anything worthwhile could come out of those bohemian, wild, cowboy-like, um, crazy people living in the New World. And of course, that perception of the United States and its science has changed an awful lot since this inception of uh, uh, back in the early 1700s.